Well, grab a seat and grab your Bible. Mark chapter 1. I'm looking forward to this text. We are now hitting the ground running. We are into the flow of Mark's narrative, uh, the body of the, this incredible gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as he says in verse 1. And we are going to begin this morning in verse 21, and we will go all the way through verse 28. It's a short story, and it's quite powerful. Mark chapter 1, verse 21 through verse 28. Follow along as, as we read it. They went into Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and began to teach. And they were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him, throwing him into convulsions. The unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He, can, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. This narrative is about one thing, and that one thing is virtually a curse word in our culture, and that is, are you ready for it? Authority. What could be more despised by our culture than authority? And this narrative is about authority. It's about Jesus and his authority. It's particularly, even to be more specific, about the authority of Jesus's teaching. When Jesus taught, it possessed intrinsic authority. Now, before we dive into Mark's narrative, I do want to just introduce this topic of authority a little bit. Now, I want a few things in our minds so that we can benefit even a little bit better, hopefully, from the narrative. When we think about authority, uh, sometimes the word authority and rightly con connotes in our mind or gives us the connotation of power. And in fact, there are some contexts in the scripture where that's probably the predominant connotation of, of some uses of the word authority, which is power. However, quite frequently, and in this case, in Mark chapter 1, the word authority in the Bible has at least two connotations, and that would include not just power, but right. Not just the ability, not just the power, but the right. Authority has to do with a right to rule, and an ability to rule. So think about the difference here. Imagine power without the right. I mean, we can, you can imagine quickly how scary that gets. If you're walking by yourself somewhere and someone who is massively bigger than you and very angry at you who wants to harm you, and they have no right to harm you, but they have the ability to do so, that's quite startling. You think about the difference uh, between somebody apprehending you simply because they can versus because they have the right. It's funny, I remember in high school, I had a friend who, uh, uh, friend might be a generous word, especially as I think about how this story unfolds. We'll call him an acquaintance, <laughs> merely an acquaintance. Uh, this, this mere acquaintance who I barely knew and never hung out with had, had a had a vehicle that looked like a, a, a police, like a, like, a, um, uh, like a county sheriff. And he had a battery-powered spinning light. <laughs> and he could just set that thing up on top of the cab of his car and pull out on the highway, and he loved to just kind of 
turn that thing on and get behind cars until they pulled over to a complete stop on the edge of the highway and then speed off. <laughs> he, had, he had the ability to pull people over. <laughs> he had no right to pull people over. He had no authority. He absolutely lacked the authority. Thinking about this, if I just said these words, locking someone up, having the right versus the power, is the difference between kidnapping and just incarceration. Think about taking a human life. The difference between right and power is the difference between capital justice and murder. Authority is an issue of power and right to rule, right to reign. It's the difference between the king of kings and the lord of lords, or even a mere human government official and a despot who has usurped authority and demands it from people over, over whom he, he dominates in an abusive fashion. In this story, we read about Jesus' authority. We see Jesus' authority on display. And again, to, once again, to be more specific than Jesus' authority is his teaching. Jesus' teaching. This is the authority of Jesus' teaching. That's the title this morning. When Jesus taught, of course it was powerful. But it wasn't just powerful because he was a good preacher. It was authoritative because he's the son of God. He's the judge. He's the son of David. He's the son of man. He has come to rule and reign, and it is his right to rule and reign. Let's pick it up in verse 21. Mark starts with this very simple geographical note, and it's kind of underwhelming. It just simply says they went into Capernaum. But what's actually pretty important about that phrase is that Mark is fond of making an entire sentence out of a phrase that could otherwise just be, when they went into Capernaum, he went to the, he went to the synagogue. But he doesn't just say when he went into Capernaum. I mean, he, he, Mark does that. He does it throughout the gospel. We're probably going to see it dozens, dozens, and dozens of times. It's all throughout Matthew. It's all throughout Luke. It's all throughout secular Greek literature. If you just want to make a geographical mark, you just simply say, well, when they went into Capernaum, such and such a thing happened. But Mark does something different. Several times at key points in his gospel, he makes a sentence out of it, and it becomes a geographical heading. And he does it once in this first section, he does it three times in the second section, three times in the third section, and then once more at the end. And, and why he does that, we'll, we'll see as the gospel unfolds. But this unfold, this begins the body of this section, which he introduced in verses 16 to 20 about the disciples. He concludes in 8, 14 to 17, or 8, 14 to 21, really, about the disciples. And now he starts into his body, and he just says, they go into Capernaum, period. And that sets apart what he's doing here in this whole section. And most of the section from Mark 1 to Mark 8 happen around the Sea of Galilee. What he does next, however, is very important. And I don't want to get super technical here, but I think this will be helpful for you, is particularly when you read narrative in the New Testament and narrative in the Old Testament. It's common to both narrative genres. Uh, what Mark does in verse 21b all the way through 22 is he, he switches verb tenses and he starts, he starts describing the setting in such a way that it's kind of, it gives us the background that we need to make sense of the, of the action sequence. So this, this sounds kind of technical. Let, let me give you the, uh, the, the easy illustration of what's happening here. Have you ever seen a movie where the movie is told by a combination of a narrator and, an action, and, and, and the, the visual in front of you? It, it, this is kind of how, how the Greek authors will tell stories, is they will give background information, and then they'll unfold the action sequence. And the, the, the background information is kind of like the narrator who's just speaking while you're watching some scene unfold. And so in whatever, such and such a year, such and such a family on such and such a town, did such and such a thing, and they start giving background, and nothing's really happening. You're just kind of seeing the camera pan, and then all of a sudden the action sequence starts to, to unfold but with the actors in front of you. And, and it's almost like a similar thing happening where a, a, a Greek um, author will, will give you the narration, the background information that you need to hear in your voice as you start to watch the action sequence unfold so that you know what's significant about the action sequence. The action sequence in this story doesn't begin until verse 23. So verse 21b and 22 are both 
utterly critical for us to think about so that we can not lose sight of the point of this narrative because there are elements of the story that could be exaggerated to the detriment of Mark's point. And we've got to get Mark's point. There's a reason why he wrote this. There's a reason why he wrote it the way he wrote it. And there's a reason why he put this story where he put it in his gospel. And so we've got to pay attention to the background. 21b says, immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue. And maybe even better, you could say he was, be- he was teaching. That, in other words, he's describing this is the habit. This is the habit of Jesus' earthly ministry is that he would go to the synagogue and he would teach. Jesus was by nature a teacher. He is the great shepherd. He is shepherding his sheep. He's giving them truth to eat. He feeds sheep. By nature, he's a shepherd. You, you, can't, you can't prevent Jesus from teaching. That's who he is. He's a teacher. And so Mark's just simply pointing out that that's just customary. This is, this is what you need to understand. Is this is the way Jesus operates. His ministry revolves around teaching truth, and as we saw last week, training men. So he goes into the synagogue, he begins to teach. And um, verse 22, still not even beginning the story, just giving us background. The customary response of the people to Jesus' teaching was amazement. Verse 22 says, they were amazed at his teaching. And that's very important. Mark emphasizes this. He begins with it and he ends with it. Skip down to verse 27. In this, at, toward the end of the action, Mark just summarizes it and says, they were all amazed. They were all amazed. And in fact, it's, it's important. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it's, it's actually interesting to make a comparison between 22 and 27. Mark says in 22, they were amazed at his teaching. In 27, they were all amazed. And he uses different words. And they're both translated by the NAS, amazed, and they both mean amazed. But there is a little bit of a difference here. The first word has the emphasis of being kind of overwhelmed. It's like there's so much happening. It's so profound. It's just overwhelming. It's like drinking from a fire hose. It's like going to a condensed class and you're getting so much information. You're like, I I can't take it anymore. And there's an element where hearing Jesus open up scripture was just literally overwhelming. The word's a compound word. The root of it is to, to strike or to blow. And it's not, it's like punch. Like think of strikes with the fist. And so the literal, literal etymology of this word would be what, what comes out of a strike or what comes out of a blow. And so it, it might only be a slight exaggeration to say that the, the, the connotation of this word would be like the, the effect that you feel if, you, got, if you, you get hit in the jaw, your jaw goes sideways, it's just you're loopy. You're like, what just happened? I have no idea where I'm at. It's just, that's, an, that's a little exaggeration. But that's, that's actually the etymology of the word. To be overwhelmed, astounded, and amazed in that sense. The, the second word in verse 27 is a, is a different word that has to do with the shock and the surprise of being astounded. It's just, <laughs> this is so shocking. And no matter where Jesus went, his teaching was shocking, overwhelming, amazing, astounding. Mark explains why people were amazed whenever he was teaching in verse 22b. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. There's a difference there. And there's a difference between what they were used to. There's a difference between what they heard in Jesus and what they would have heard on a typical Shabbat morning in a synagogue. And so let me give you an example. In fact, I thought I would have to look long and hard. Um, Probably my favorite resource to understand uh, typical Jewish rabbinical teaching is the Mishnah. The Mishnah was written around 200 years after Christ, but what it is is it's, it's a scribes writing down what would have been common teaching from one, the first century B.C. all the way through to the, end of, the beginning of the second century uh, A.D. So really uh, about 100 years before Christ up until a couple generations after Christ. And so the Mishnah records what would have been typical teaching. So I actually was thinking, like, I'll probably have to look at a few examples and try to find one that works. I literally just opened it up to the very beginning. So I'm just going to read to you, because in case you haven't done your devotions in the Mishnah recently, I just want to, you know, freshen you up on this. First three verses from the tractate Barakot, which just means um, blessings, 
And there's track dates on every, all sorts of things in the Mishnah, you know, uh, marriage and divorce and oaths and everything else and, 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 and Sabbath and how far you can travel. All those things are recorded in the Mishnah. So here's an example. It begins talking about what time, people, what time of day you should recite the Shema in the evening. Well, one person says, from the hour that the priests enter uh, until they eat their heave offering, until the end of the first watch. So the end of the first watch of the night, to, from the time of dinner until the end of the first watch, you can recite the Shema anywhere inside that time period, and you are A-OK. And then come the words of Rabbi Eleazar. Oh, those are the rab- words of Rabbi Eleazar, sorry. And then, but the sages say, here comes the debate, until midnight. Here's a few examples. Rabbi Gamaliel says, until the rise of dawn. Gamaliel's sons returned from a banquet hall after midnight. They said to him, we have not yet recited the Shema. He said to them, if the dawn has not risen, you are obligated to recite the Shema. And this applies not only in this case, rather it regards all the commandments which the sages may may, say may be performed until midnight. So you can actually fulfill that as long as you do it before dawn, according to Gamaliel. But if the the sages say this, uh, why do they say until midnight? Well, it's in order that, to protect a man from sin. From what time do they recite the Shema in the morning? From the hour that one can distinguish between the colors blue and white. So now you're having a debate about what time did the sun come up? Well, it's when you can look at the sky and there's enough sunlight to go from pitch black sky to now you can see the color difference between blue and white. There's a cloud, there's the sky. Okay, now there's enough sun, I can tell the difference. At that point, it's too late. Don't even try reciting the Shema at that point. Oh my goodness. You can see white and blue in the sky. It's over. And so, from the, hour, from the hours, one can distinguish between blue and white, but Rabbi Eleazar says between blue and green. Now, if you're colorblind, you're just hopeless in this whole debate, but <laughs> nevertheless, that's important for you to know. And one must complete it before sunrise. And so you've got alternate interpretations, whether sunrise is the blue and white contrast or the blue from blue-green contrast. And some of us, even with, when the sunlight is shining, we can't tell the difference between blue and green. Rabbi Joshua says, before the third hour. And then it goes on to explain that, and I'll spare you his explanation. But we're not done. Then the house of Shammai say, in the evening everyone should recline in order to recite the Shema, and in the morning they should stand, as it says in the passage of the Shema, when you lie down and when you rise up, Deuteronomy 6, 7. But the house of Hillel say, everyone may recite according to his own manner, whether reclining or standing, as it says, as you walk by the way, in the same verse. If it is so that you may recite however you wish, why does the verse say, when you lie down and when you rise? Answer, it means you must recite the Shema at, at the hour that people lie down at night and at the hour that they rise in the morning. But then, you, you're tracking? You ready for this? Rabbi Tarfon says, I was coming along the road in the evening and I reclined to recite the Shema as required by the house of Shammai. And in doing so, I placed myself in danger of being attacked by bandits. And they said to him, you are yourself responsible for what might have befallen you, for you violated the very words of Hillel. You understand what he's saying? He's like, okay, I tried to follow the advice from the house of Shammai, and look what happened. So the followers of Hillel say, well, that's your own fault. You got beat up because you obeyed his interpretation. You should have obeyed ours. There's, in one passage, about how to obey one verse, I think I just read to you about five distinct and competing rabbinical interpretations. And that was the teaching they were used to. This is written after Jesus, about 150 years after Jesus, but it's recording the teaching that would have occurred throughout Jesus' earthly ministry. You see, what they were used to on a typical Shabbat morning was somebody who was learned, and they had read a lot, and they stood up in front of the people, and it was an opportunity to display knowledge and how much they had read, and here's this position, and here's this scholar, and here's this thinker, and here's his view, and here's this, and here's that, and here's that. Jesus stands up in the synagogue and he speaks with something that is foreign to their experience, namely authority. He has the right to be speaking divine and eternal truths. He's not reciting positions. He's not footnoting arguments. 
He's speaking truth, and it's flowing out of him. There's something about this authority. It's not, it's not presenting information that's up for grabs. It's not presenting arguments to see, will you follow this argumentation, and will you agree with it? And it's not a practice of oratory to see if the audience is interested in appreciating the style of the speaker. There is nothing about Jesus' teaching that leaves the listener in the driver's seat. Nothing. Not the content, not the manner. He's not asking for uh, assent in some sort of uh, spineless, wishy-washy way, like, are they going to agree with this? Are they going to like this? I don't know. And he's just declaring it. And there's no debate. It has authority. It's absolutely authoritative. And this is shocking. So now, verse 23, we're ready for the story. He comes to this synagogue. <laughs> synagogue is a word that obviously you're all familiar with. You can't uh, read the New Testament without being familiar with it. But synagogue was an idea that was developed during the exile. And after the exile, when the Jews came back to the nation, they, they began setting up synagogues throughout the nation of Israel. And the practice was that any town in the nation of Israel that had more than 10 men um, ten men being, you know, as, as, as they, as they uh, uh, tallied the population according to the military, so males above the age of 20. And if you had more than 20 males above the age of 20, then you could have a synagogue. And so the synagogue would be the local area of worship. They would, they would uh, meet together and teach uh, the Torah and study the scriptures together. Um, uh, it, by the time of Jesus' in Jesus' day, which is, uh, you know, 400 years into the whole synagogue practice, by that point, most towns had their own synagogue. It was like a physical structure. There would have been a fixed location. Um, and, and it's interesting, we have uh, archaeological remains from the synagogue in, in Corinth, and that was built in the second century, so that was even built after Jesus' time. And it had a lintel, a, a heading that read, Synagogue of the Jews. The synagogue here, we're reading about a, a specific synagogue, namely in Capernaum. If you've been to Israel, it's, it's, it, there, there's a synagogue right there in Capernaum. That structure is not the same structure that Jesus would have stood in because that structure was actually built in the third century. But if you've been there, you, you probably noticed, or hopefully you noticed, that underneath those exterior walls, which were built in the third century, there's footings, uh, and those footings are original to the first century. And so uh, there's really no reason to doubt that that's the exact location where this story took place, is where the traditional site, the, 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 the synagogue, in Capernaum. And it would have been typical for Sabbath practice, for synagogue worship, um, for, for there to be somebody read the, to read the scriptures. And if there was a visiting rabbi, they would even ask the visiting rabbi to read the scriptures. That happens when he, Jesus establishes his earthly ministry here in, in Galilee. But when he goes back to Nazareth to visit in Luke 4, they a invite him to speak. And so he speaks and he starts teaching on Isaiah 61 after reading Isaiah 61 out of the scroll. Same thing happened with Paul in, for instance, Acts 13. He shows up in the synagogue in Pisidian Antioch, and they recognize him as a rabbi. He was an internationally known rabbi. He was a brilliant rabbi. And they asked him to teach. And so he opens up the Old Testament and starts reasoning with them from the scriptures about the, the deity of Jesus Christ, who is their Messiah. And so that would have been typical synagogue practice. And so Jesus here is doing that. Verse 23, he goes in, and notice the first thing it mentions in this particular story, this particular scene, is this man with an unclean spirit. He cried out. What's the significance of that? Well, obviously, the significance is what he's about to say, but even before we get to the content, isn't it fascinating to notice that Mark helps us to see that Jesus is not initiating this encounter? He's simply teaching, and the demon can't help but blow his cover. The demon is a creature under authority. Think about that for a second. This demon, this demon doesn't want to be exposed. 
This demon just got exposed by authoritative teaching, the authoritative proclamation of truth. He says in verse 24, what business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? And the, the idiom in the original is just, what, what is it to you and to me? What is it to you and to me? And that becomes a very common um, idiom. It's used several times in the Old Testament, several times in the New Testament. And, and there is some debate about the exact nuance, but what's true of, I think, every instance where this idiom is used, it's in a context of hostility. It's in a context of hostility, either perceived or real. And so it's kind of like, what business do we have with each other? In other words, what's there between us? Or even, why are you interfering? And that's probably the connotation. Why are you interfering? This context, it's always used in a context of hostility. And here is a cosmic showdown between the authorities and powers of this world with the authority and the power of the Son of God. That's what's on display here, is this showdown. And you might be asking the question, why does this demon show up in the synagogue? And the better question would be, how would this demon avoid being exposed in the synagogue when the Son of God shows up teaching truth authoritatively? That's the better question. And we've got to understand the nature of this cosmic battle and what's it involved in, with the Son of God reversing the curse and subjugating the entire earth. And the earth that's currently under the rule of Satan himself, what does what that involve? And you, we've talked about this in the uh, preface to Mark. We talked about Genesis 3.15, the, the first articulation of the gospel in the curse against uh, the serpent. God says that uh, there's going to be animosity between her seed and your seed, speaking to the serpent. And so the influence of Satan, the sons of Satan, those who Satan is their father, are the ones who are lying and murdering. They're under his influence. Those who are um, of the seed are those who have been purchased by his atonement, and they are under his influence, and they have been, are they in process of being restored back to the image of God, because Christ is the image of God. We are created in the image of God. We fell, and he's restoring that image. And when it comes to the issue of reversing the curse, the Son of God is becoming man in order to reverse the curse in this earth before it's destroyed and before there's a new heavens and new earth. That's going to be the most profound display of power in, in the latter days when Christ subjugates every enemy under his feet. But Genesis 3.15 says you're going, to, you're going to strike his heel and he's going to crush your head. And the crushing of the head of the enemy becomes a theme and you can see it in Numbers 23. You can see it in Romans 16. You can see it in Revelation at the very end. Through Jesus Christ, the head of Satan and all of his influence is going to be crushed. But currently, currently Satan has power in this world. Just think about this for a second. Ephesians 2.2 calls Satan the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Paul says that he is the god of this world. The god of this world is nothing less than the devil, Satan himself, who blinds the minds of the unbelieving. So there are people who are not believing and they could hear authoritative teaching from Jesus Christ and not see it because the God of this world has blinded their eyes to even see the glories of the gospel. Second Timothy chapter two, verses 25 to 26 says that, that sinners are currently being held captive by Satan to do his will. And then Revelation 20 says that he will be bound for a thousand years during Christ's reign on this earth, but obviously he is not bound now and he is ruling this world in a delegated fashion. Let me just make another comment here before we finish this story about the nature of demons and their goal. It's almost a strange world that we live in that you read the scriptures and people have sometimes have such an anti-supernatural bent that they almost imagine like, oh, this is something old. This is some sort of uh, superstitious telling of some story and they just try uh, ascribe some sort of um, phenomena, some sort of um, paranormal phenomena to demonic activity because that's just kind of the customary in that day. They believed there were such things as demons. Well, of course there are such things as demons. There's no question about whether there's demons. Demons are very real. The question, though, is what do they do? 
<laughs> what is their goal? What are they after? Demons are not interested in scaring people. <laughs> As if the, demon, the, the demonic world and Satan and his influence have won some point on the cosmic scoreboard if they scared somebody uh, on some particular evening and prevented them from going on a walk alone in the dark. Ha, 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 they never left their house. Point for us. What was accomplished for the purpose of darkness? Nothing. That has nothing to do with their purposes. What do they do? According to John 8, they lie and they murder. Satan himself is the father of lies, and he is a murderer from the beginning. And so those who lie and plot and murder are sons of Satan. They are the seed of Satan in the Genesis 3.15 fashion. Their goal is to harm. Their goal is to harm physically. And I believe that that's even alluded to in verse 26, throwing him into convulsions. I believe that's an attempt of the demon to even harm him physically. Whether it's not, or we don't have to guess. By the time we get to Mark chapter 9, there's a father with a son whose son is demon-possessed, and that demon tries to throw him into the fire, tries to throw him into the lake. He doesn't care if he burns him. He doesn't care if he drowns him. His desire is harmful intent. And those are physical examples but even more so spiritually. And let's, let's just turn real quick for a second. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm not going to belabor this, but I'm just going to go to one, one cross-reference, and it's in, in, in these two chapters, and you put this together, you have a very helpful and profound grasp of what the demonic world is after. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11... Let's pick it up in verse 12. Paul is writing, and he's kind of making a defense for his ministry, and he's explaining why he's making a defense. And you're, what you're going to see here is you can see that he starts to highlight who he's defending his ministry against, namely the false apostles who are hurting the church, hurting the church spiritually. And what's important for our purposes in Mark 1 is to understand what's behind the influence of these false apostles. Let's pick it up in verse 12, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 12. But what am I doing? Uh, I will continue to do so that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded as we are in the matter about which they are boasting. So he's going to pit himself against the, the, uh, these false apostles. Verse 13, such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising, or even more literally, a big deal, if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Notice, Satan's not interested in scaring people. He's not interested in producing paranormal activity that makes people think, oh, I don't want to go outside, or that's really scary, that's really frightening. You know what he's interested in doing? He's interested in deceiving He's interested in corrupting the church. He's interested in ruining discernment. He's interested in contaminating truth with just a little bit of error. And his best tactic is not to show up like some boogeyman. His best tactic is to show up like a spiritual leader who looks like a pastor who can repeat 90% of truth and know just exactly where to lace it with error that will harm real Christians. He's already got the world under his under his rule. Sons of darkness, he already rules them, he already owns them. What he wants to do is ruin the joy of true Christians. If he, if, if he could, he would cut off all of God's children from a relationship with God through error and immorality. He wants to compromise doctrine, he wants to contaminate morals, he wants to harm, and he wants to harm spiritually, and his best tactic is to disguise himself as an angel of light, as a servant of righteousness. Now, let's fast forward to chapter 12, flip one chapter over, look at 2 Corinthians 12, and remember what he says here? Talking about this um, thorn that was given to torment him, you know, and you can read about what this is. It's, oh, it's, this, it's uh, some sort of eye disease, and he's just, uh, you know, some degeneration, and, he, you know, he doesn't have a good enough ophthalmologist. I mean, who knows? And they go on and on. Well, it, it's very clear what the thorn is. He, you compare it between chapter 11 and chapter 12, it's very clear. It's the same reference. 
Verse 7, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. What is it? Well, comma, here's what it is. A messenger of Satan. It's interesting that the word messenger there is Greek angelos, and that's the exact same word that he used in chapter 11. Go back to chapter 11, verse uh, 13. I'm sorry, um, verse 14. He says, no wonder even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, and now here in verse 7, this thorn is a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. And then he says in verse 8, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And then he goes on to talk later in the chapter, verses 19 through 21, how he's come to them three times, and he's hoping that this third time they would have dealt with the error in the church. Three times this messenger has been given to Paul. What's this messenger? It's the satanic influence. It's demonic activity, perverting the church doctrinally, contaminating the gospel, harming souls, and Paul is on a mission to root it out for the safety and for the welfare and the joy of those saints and the glory of Christ in Corinth. And God doesn't remove it to even humble Paul so that Paul wouldn't think that the fruit that's happening in Corinth has to do with Paul. Wow. Demons are very real, but their mode is not to scare people. It's to deceive from the truth, to enslave, to error, to entrap in immorality. Demons, demons are in any area of the world where truth is being taught. Their greatest tactic is to slip in unawares, as Jude says, and turn the gospel of grace into license for impurity. That's the demonic mode. So now go back to chapter 1. That's what's in my mind when I said these demons, this demon just got exposed. He didn't want to get exposed. He wants to prevent this man from seeing the glory of Christ by blinding him to the truth. But the teaching of Jesus has such authority that he couldn't tolerate it. The authority of Jesus smokes this demon out. And so that's why he says, what business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? As if to say, why are you interfering? He's not asking, why are you interfering? Because he doesn't know what Jesus' interference would end up producing, he actually says that in the very next phrase. Have you come to destroy us? Think about it. This demon knows who he's dealing with. He says in the third sentence of, that he utters, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. He sees the contrast. He knows the contrast between him by nature and Jesus by nature. Here is an unclean spirit. In contrast to the Holy One of God, he sees the difference. He knows the difference. He can't help but recognize the difference. And he is under authority, unwillfully, but nevertheless under the authority of Jesus Christ. And he is smoked out and exposed. Is this, is this it? Is this the moment I'm going into the abyss? Is this the end of my, my freedom to deceive and murder and cut people off from the truth? Jesus rebuked him. Be quiet. Come out of him. That's it. Two verbs. It's over. Verse 26, throwing him into a convulsion, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. <laughs> I read one resource on uh, the powers of evil. It documented um, charismatic scholars describing um, how, you, how you cast out how, you know, exorcisms, how you cast out demons, uh, one said this is typically like a 12-hour process. Another one said this is a three- to five-day process. Well, this was <laughs> one verse. took me all of eight seconds to read it. This is an issue of authority. Jesus possesses this authority. And so when he rebukes the Spirit, the Spirit has no option. His truth exposed him. He personally cast him out. 
And so, verse 27, they were all amazed. Everyone's amazed. Their amazement turns into a debate. They start having to debate about what kind, what is this? What is this? This is a new teaching. This is crazy what's going on here. We've never seen anything like this. We've never heard anything like this. What is going on? I mean, and, and notice the summary. What I love is the, the, the last phrase in verse 27. This observation helps us understand why this narrative is all about authority. Because notice what they say. They don't say, what is this? This dude's casting out demons. What is this? This guy's doing amazing phenomena that we've never seen before. What is this? This guy is like, I mean, he's legit. This is not like a magician. This is not sleight of hand. I mean, it's like real, the kind of phenomena that are happening. And you got to come see this. It's an amazing show. What's the first thing out of their mouth? What is this? A teaching with authority. And then secondly, and, and he commands the unclean spirits and they obey him. Don't, don't lose what Mark is doing here, he's pointing out the most notable experience that they just encountered was teaching with authority. That is some kind of teaching, and that is some kind of authority, that you would hear Jesus Christ open up the word of God and cast out a demon in the same sermon, and you'd walk away and saying, that is an amazing sermon. Oh, and did you hear what happened at like the 38 minute mark? He cast out this demon. But man, teaching with authority. And that's always the way it is with truth. Even in the apostolic era, when apostles are given delegated authority and they're actually producing phenomena of the miraculous nature, even then it did not swallow up or drown out the teaching. It merely affirmed it. The teaching is centerpiece. That's why Jesus came. We're going to see that in a couple of stories later on in chapter 1. That was the purpose of his mission. He couldn't help but cast out demons because that's his nature. He couldn't help but heal disease. That's his nature. He couldn't help but stop natural phenomena that harm people. That's his nature. He couldn't help but reverse the curse. That's his nature. But his mission is teaching, teaching truth to people who need it. And their response is, I've never heard teaching like that. And we also saw a demon cast out, but I've never seen, I've never heard teaching like that. Immediately, this is almost an understatement, you're almost like, yeah, I could have written this verse. Immediately, the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. I'll say, that word spreads fast. This is new. This is amazing. This is astounding. This is overwhelming. It's almost so much of a shock to our system because of its novelty and its distinction that you cannot help but talk about it and be impressed. We're almost to Mark's point. <laughs> you didn't know I, had, I was going to do a, that long of an intro <laughs> to get to Mark's point in the last five minutes of the sermon. What's Mark doing here? Mark's beginning the story with an emphasis, an exclamatory emphasis on Jesus' authoritative teaching. He compares and contrasts the response of demons to the response of the people. The people, verse 22, are amazed in the sense that they are overwhelmed. In verse 27, they are amazed in the sense that they are shocked and surprised. The demons are terrorized. They are startled. They are scared spitless if they could have spit. I mean, this demon knows he's dealing with his creator. We are seeing authority on display, and Mark is doing something with that authority. And so before I even tell you Mark's point, follow me on one more train of thought. We've already documented who Jesus is. Jesus of Nazareth, we, he was born right here in this earthly ministry that we're reading about. As a person, he existed before his human birth. We documented that, right? Old Testament. Angel of the Lord, messenger of the covenant. He's the son of God. He's the second person of the Trinity. Remember the creation account? In the beginning, God, spirits hovering over the waters. Creation account doesn't begin until God starts speaking. And it's through the word of God, it's through the expression of God that God created everything. 
Psalm 33, verse 6, by the word of the Lord, God created the creation. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was, was God, the word was with God, and nothing has come into being except through him. Everything that has ever come into being came into being through this person, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You want to talk about authority. He has authority over, as he says in Job 38, over the oceans to say, here's the beach and you don't cross. He has authority to say, I'm storing up snow and I let it out when I want to. He has authority to say, when the animals uh, calve and give birth and when they die. He has authority to determine all things. He has right to rule and reign. He has power over it and the right over everything created. And get this, you go back to the creation account and you realize that the pre-incarnate Christ, before he was Jesus of Nazareth, this same individual has such authority that not only does everything created submit to his authority, but non-existent things submit to his authority. Is that not the most profound reality to think here, this individual can speak to things that don't exist and say, let there be light. Light doesn't even exist. And even after light existed, it doesn't have a will to even rebel against God. It's non-existing and in its non-existing state, which means it's not there, the authority of this person is such that for him to say, let there be light, it cannot help but come into existence. That, my friends, is authority. Power and right. What's shocking, I, I, I cannot get over the shock of this. Demons are under his authority, and they obey unwillingly. The created order obeys. Non-existent things obey. And here comes mankind, encounters this kind of authority, and they, for Mark's purposes, in the main, they respond with curiosity. Why do I say that? They're amazed. The demons are terrified. Neither are saved. Mark is already documenting where, what I mentioned last week, where he's going. Chapter 3, verse 6, the leaders or hard of heart in verse 5, so they start conspiring against him, verse 6. Mark chapter 6, verse 6, the people, the nation of Israel, are unbelieving to the degree that Jesus, in turn, is shocked and amazed at their unbelief. Mark's already documenting the response of the leaders, the response of the nation to Jesus Christ, and he's already preparing the disciples to see the unbelief still resident in their own hearts, maybe not in an unsaved fashion, but at least as as they're following Christ, there's still unbelief yet to be dealt with. And Mark is pointing out that, look, you're going to see people who respond to the truth, and they are impressed by it, they are amazed by it, they are astounded by it, but that's different than submission to authority. What I did is, just to conclude, I, I came up with a list of four reasons why sometimes people are amazed at Christ's words without submitting to his authority. And I put this on the, on the uh, PowerPoint. I think it's on the handout as well. So you can pull this up. You don't have to take notes. Obviously, you can if you want. Reasons why people are amazed at Christ's words without submitting to his authority. First of all, curiosity about a new message. There's intrigue here because it's new to their experience. The motives that are being played on here is just avoidance of boredom. They're just tired of the same old, same old. Hearing rabbi, quote, rabbi, quote, rabbi, quote, rabbi, contradict himself, contradict himself, contradict himself. I mean, I just, suddenly here comes a man with authority, and whoa. I mean, it's the freshness of hearing somebody who's not just presenting some sort of argument, putting intellect on display, here is a man who has a word from the living God, and it's not up for debate, and he's declaring it with all authority. I don't care what you think, this is truth, and it's binding, and it's authoritative on you. And that's actually true of all prophets, and true of all apostles, and not true of all true, as defined by the New Testament, true pastors. There is declaration from on high of an authority because it's a message that we did not come up with. It was given to us from on high by God himself. However, there is one difference. 
There is one difference. Jesus exclusively can correct the world on his own personal authority. Good example of that, go read the Sermon on the Mount, because he doesn't just say, you've heard it said this about the Old Testament, but here's what the Old Testament actually says. I have the authority to do that, you have the authority to do that, because that's what the Bible says. Jesus, not only does he not contradict the, New Testament, the Old Testament or the New Testament, he actually, he actually refutes the error on his own personal authority, and he says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. That's what sets Jesus apart from every prophet, every apostle, and every faithful preacher, is the intrinsic personal authority. And this is unique, and you know what? I've seen a lot of people for a short season flourish under authoritative preaching because it's so different than what they have experienced in whatever religious circle they came from. That's different than submission to authority. That's, that's one reason why people come, and that's one reason why people are amazed, is curiosity about a new message. Another, another reason is pride over a different message. And what I mean by that is, sometimes there's pride because what you're hearing in an authoritative message from Christ and from Christ's word is so different than the culture around you, or it's so different than uh, what you've heard in church before. It, it just, it smacks of like freshness because it's politically incorrect. It's a little bit shocking. It's edgy. And it makes the uh, listener feel a little bit like, you know, smug because ha, I'm sitting under some really, really difficult stuff and nobody else is tolerating this. There's pride here toward other ministries. There's maybe perhaps even bitterness and disdain toward a, the demise of a culture that is uh, increasingly um, detrimental to your idols. And so you are angry at the declining culture around you, and that might produce anger or fear. And so you become bitter and disdain toward that. So a message that kind of you can muster up into your own corner politically or morally to get scratch whatever idol you want, for a short season, that actually might astound you and impress you. Third reason, I've seen this, hard preaching can sometimes salve a guilty conscience. Obviously, it can't clean a guilty conscience. Only the shed blood of Christ can clean a conscience. I remember one chapter in my ministry, I was preaching through Romans at a college Bible study, and um, I had a lot of young men coming to that Bible study because they were coming from a Christian university down the road and they had just never heard teaching like that before. And I started realizing after about six months of this in sudden revival among this college campus, people just carpooling and the, you know, cars were showing up in this parking lot in this driveway, like, you know, just loaded, the, you know, two, two people per seat belt and it's just, it was just jam-packed and people are coming and you're like, oh, this is great, it's a revival. About six months in, it became pretty clear the reason why they were coming was because it was just so jarring, stimulating, and it was kind of, for somebody who's fouling up their conscience all week, kind of feels good to have a really hard sermon. Oh man, that was a miserable week. And you come to Bible study and you just get punched in the gut and you're like, yeah, I feel better now. And they just go keep living the same way they're living and suddenly the teaching starts to catch up and there starts to be a bite and there starts to be a cost. And oh, wait a minute, friend, are, you're, you're, you're living this way? And those same people who came to salve their conscience were gone just as quick. The fourth reason why people often are amazed at Christ's teaching but don't submit to his authority is because Christ's teaching gives many temporal benefits. The motive here is self-love. There are so many benefits to Christ's teaching simply by the fact that Jesus Christ is so good. He's so good. When Jesus Christ rules this earth as dictator, unbelievers are going to see how good they have it. He is that good by nature. And so you, you see the rule of Christ and the reign of Christ um, in a people group, 
and you start seeing the benefits. I mean, everyone wants the benefits of Christ's teaching. They want the benefit of a society that produces a robust work ethic, that produces a reap what you sow principle, where goods and, and uh, material possessions become easier to acquire, cheaper to afford, increased in quality, and you can actually benefit from those purchases longer, and you can get them to your house quicker. Everybody loves the idea of raising their children in a home, in a society where you don't have to worry about them getting run over by a drunk driver on their walk home from school. Christ is so good that when people are under his influence, it's better for everyone, and the self-loving listener will actually be quite astounded and amazed and impressed with Christ's teaching for a short while, though what the world always wants is this impossible contradiction. They long for the benefits of Christ's rule with the freedom from his personal rule over their own wicked lusts. I want to live how I want, and I want all of his benefits. And so Mark's point here in beginning with this response is to show us that it's not enough to be amazed at his teaching. People, in, as these disciples are training, they're watching their friends and their family, they're watching a nation who has just received a Messiah and is now impressed with his teaching, but not believing it, not submitting to it, and Mark's pointing out that the amazement and awe at Christ's words, devoid of willful submission, is no more beneficial than the terror of these demons. Believer, I know this sermon has kind of a negative tone to it. It's looking at it from the side of unbelief, because that's Mark's point. How sweet is it that by the power of the Spirit we can submit to Christ's teaching? It's that authoritative. It's so authoritative, no one escapes his authority. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. According to Paul in Philippians 2, that Jesus Christ is Lord. According to Isaiah in Isaiah 45, every tongue will confess that only in me are found righteousness and truth. And in me, the divine speaker, Yahweh, who is Christ, says, in me, all Israel will be justified and will glory. His authority is so profound that it, it can be spurned by mankind. Mankind is the only thing in the created order that has somehow been given this ability to rebel against God's authority for a short season, but even we can't pull it off. And my friends, if you are not submitting to Christ's authority in your heart, if he is not the Lord of your life, if his desires are not your desires, if his priorities are not your, des your priorities, you're no better off than the demons. It doesn't matter how impressed you are at teaching. It doesn't matter how much you read your Bible. Do you submit to his authority? Father, we're so thankful for this text. It's just a sober story, Lord. It's just shocking to our senses. And I'm, that's my concern, Lord. I know that when we study the details, your word is always amazing and astounding. But Lord, I, my, my, my longing is for submission. Lord, as we close our service this morning in song, I just pray that in our hearts, we would pour out our hearts to you right now, and I pray that this prayer would even be the prayer of everyone here. Lord, take our minds, take our hearts, take our hands, take our feet, take our resources, take our ambitions. I pray that every ambition, every dream, every hope that we have for this life would just be lit on fire for the sake of just wanting you and your ambitions to guide and govern all that we are. We long to submit to your sweet authority. And I pray that for any here who, maybe they're hearing it as an outsider, and maybe they're realizing as they even hear this, maybe they thought, I relate more to the human audience that was just simply amazed and started spreading the word because of the novelty of it, but yet did not bow the knee to your son. Lord, I just pray that they would even be struck and stopped dead in their tracks to consider whether they are in any different situation than the demons. And so, Lord, thank you for the authority Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for your authority, for your authoritative teaching, for giving us your word, giving us access to it so that we can submit, so that we can benefit, so that you get glory and we get all the joy. Um, we just pray, Lord, that you'd be glorified and honored now as we sing worship to you and certainly as we practice submitting to your authority in a way that only true children can. Thank you for that privilege. In your name we pray. Amen.